Waalaikumsalam uh, good afternoon. And how uh, everybody, I hope uh, everyone is in a good of health, even though we are in the pandemic se uh, situation, but I hope everyone is okay. Okay. So today uh, I'm going to share my lectures on uh, thermal analysis on polymeric based material. And thank you ITS for inviting me to be a guest lecture uh, under the program of guest lecture series department. Okay, uh, so can I share the screen now? Yeah. Yes, okay. Okay, so I will, give, I will be given uh, two hours, right, for the uh, presentation, is it? Yeah. Yeah, doctor, two hours, including question, uh, question and answer. And answer. Yeah. So I try to uh, to finish it within a time. So if there's any problem, just uh, uh, contact, uh, uh, just uh, give uh, or just call me. Lah. Okay, so, so can you see my slide? Yes, doctor. Yes. Ready. Okay. So, uh, okay, thank uh, So, my lecture for today is on thermal analysis on polymeric based material. And I am Associate Professor Dr. Nanajwin Hajibonia. So, uh, the outlines of my lecture today is on polymeric materials uh, and TSC analysis, also TG analysis. Okay, actually, I'm teaching in UITM Shalam. I'm teaching three codes, which is polymeric materials, uh, material characterization, and also industrial material selection. So for today, I combine these two codes, which is polymeric materials and material characterization, especially uh, on thermal analysis. And uh, I combine these two codes and uh, as a topic for our lecture series for today. Okay, and then if we have time, we will go for question and answer session. Is it okay, everyone? Okay. Yes, doctor. Okay. So, what is a polymeric materials? So, polymerics material uh, in in our situation, you know, in everyday life, uh, we need to, we have a lot of uh, uh, basic material, which is ceramic, metal and alloy, uh, polymers, uh, composite wood, rubbers and polymer foams. And this kind of uh, material giving you different types of properties. Okay, these properties giving you opportunity to produce different type of product. So the basic, the, the basic that we always, uh, uh, meat is the ceramic, metal, and polymers. Okay, so when we talk about ceramic, we assume that this um, material is very brittle. And we talk about metal and alloy, this is a very tough and hard and strength uh, material. And when we talk about polymer, we assume that this is a plastic that can be bent and very light in weight and uh, easy to get. So this is the things that uh, when we uh, call when we talk about ceramic metal and this is what uh, come up in our mind, right? So uh, in order to get these properties, so we need to uh, analyze all those material because all those material come up with different uh, strength and different properties. And this kind of material can combine in order to produce a new material such as composite. And we can have the strength of the composite that is similar to the metal and alloy, uh, glasses, porous ceramic, and also uh, wood production. Okay, the composite is a combination between uh, uh, always as a polymer, as a matrix, and fillers that come up from metal and alloy, ceramic, and glasses and also wood. So the combination, the uh, modification of this material needs analysis in order to know the properties that uh, each of the material have. Okay, so now we're focusing on polymer. So what is polymer? 
So uh, I assume all the students, uh, this is the 2018 and 2019 batch, right? So this is your third year, right? Or uh, the fourth year? So I hope uh, everyone know what is a polymer. Okay. So polymer characteristic is uh, good in density. Okay, so have a good coefficient of friction, a good corrosion resistance, so good moldability, and excellent surface finish where you can uh, mold uh, this uh, material in a complicated shape. And you can have a good surface finish even though it is a complicated shape. And polymer is well known as a very economic material with a good tensile strength. And sometimes uh, if you modify it, we can have a good mechanical properties of polymer. If you blend the uh, uh, basic polymer with the engineering uh, is the high end polymer, such as a, uh, epoxy blend with the rubber, you can have a good mechanical strength of uh, the uh, polymer. And the specialty is this polymer can be produced in transparent or uh, in different colors, which is hardly to, to, to be done to metal and alloy and also ceramic. So this is the example of a polymeric material production. Okay. So there's a lot of uh, polymer uh, material in the world. So this is a part of it. And the specialty of uh, polymer is we can uh, produce the polymer by uh, properties that we want. If you want to have the low density polyethylene, you can produce it. If you want to have the high density polyethylene, we can modify it and produce it. And these two polyethylene, even though in the same family, but it produces different types of properties that can be produced, uh, that can be used in different types of application. Okay, that is the speciality of polymer. That is why that is why uh, it is widely used in all over the world. Okay, so this is the historical development. Uh, just to give you uh, some uh, info on the historical development of polymer before uh, uh, before it developed until now. So before this, we assume it is come from plant. And then until uh, John Wesley Hyatt produced the first polymer called cellulose nitrate in uh, 20th century. And the understanding of polymer have been, uh, have been with us uh, from the beginning, which is from plants, from animal and so on, uh, is uh, 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 corrected by the uh, Nobel Prize uh, winner, Hesh Stoddinger, when he find out that polymer is a combination of small, small monomer combined together and um, by a chemical bonding to produce a polymer, polymer uh, chain. So that is what polymer it is. Okay, so the combination of this is using polymerization method. Okay. So small molecule consisting uh, unit, known monomer, and a few oligomers chemically joined to create a giant molecules. Okay, everyone, do you understand until now? Yes. Okay, so now we go to what, uh, because we focus uh, focusing on the thermal analysis, so I just give you a bit introduction of polymer. So, uh, so uh, this is a polymer, and there are many types of polymer, which is elastomer, thermoplastic, and also thermoset. And thermoplastic, elastomer, and thermoset can be in a linear chain, branch, and also cross-link. Okay, and this uh, arrangement of polymer will giving you different types of properties. Okay. And this thermoplastic and thermoset can, uh, in, can come in amorphous or semi-crystalline 
or crystalline uh, structure. And this amorphous, semi-crystalline and crystalline structure also will giving you different thermal properties and different mechanical properties. So <clears throat> that's why thermal analysis is very important to polymeric base material. Okay, and then this uh, polymer can be in homopolymer and also copolymer. So homopolymer is a polymer with the same monomer. So if you polyethylene, uh, polyvinyl chloride, polypropylene, we call it homopolymer because it is come from the same monomer. If you have two types of monomer in a polymer chain, we call it copolymer. Okay, so this copolymer can be in block. So the arrangement of the monomer in a block, block of monomer A combined with monomer B. Okay, and alternate A, B, A, B, A, B, and also random, which is the monomer arrangement is random uh, arranged in the polymer chain. So this kind of arrangement also distribute to the different types of properties to the polymer. So as I said before, polymer uh, can be in polymer family can be thermoplastic, thermoset, and elastomer. So this uh, what is the difference between thermoplastic, thermoset, and elastomer? Is thermoplastic can be recycled? Okay, <coughs> thermoset is a very <coughs> sorry, it's a crosslink material and cannot be. Uh, Recycle, okay. <coughs> Sorry, yeah. <coughs> and then this is covalently bonded, okay. And thermoplastic is a van der Waals uh, weak uh, bond, <coughs> and we have elastoma. <coughs> sorry, sorry. You can take a drink, doctor. <laughs> okay. Can we stop a bit? Good <laughs> job. Because I need to drink water. Yeah, yeah, no problem. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> okay, sorry for the dis uh, distraction. Okay, for the elastoma, uh, known also as rubber, and the elastic deformation is more than 200% from its actual length. So that is the difference between elastoma, thermoset, and thermoplastic. So the main difference between these three is thermoset is a cross-link, a very brittle polymer. Elastoma is a very elastic, and thermoplastic is, can be recycled and behave in plastic manner. And but not too elastic compared to elastomer. So this is the three basic uh, uh, polymer in a polymer family. Okay. So we can differentiate these three polymer by using stress over strain curve two. Okay. If you got this kind of curve, it represents thermoplastic material. If you pre if you have this kind of curve. Okay, this show you there is no elongation or plastic region uh, curve, so it's re, it's uh, represent the thermoset polymer. And if you got this kind of curve, which is a very long of uh, elongation, uh, it represent the elastomer material. Okay, do you understand? Yes. Okay, so now the polymer when you add something on it. We call it plastic. Okay, if you don't add any uh, filler or pigment, we cannot call it plastic. So polymer, uh, plastic is a polymer material, but polymer is not a plastic until you add something in order to produce it as a plastic. Okay, so we have two types of uh, plastic, which is commodity plastic and also engineering plastic. So for commodity plastic, we have uh, something like everyday use 
uh, food packaging, easy to get. That is commodity. Engineering plastic is something that you need, uh, you hard to get. It's a very expensive, such as uh, plastic for automotive application, electronic, and also um, uh, medical, something like that. That is engineering plastic. Okay, so these are uh, these are the things that when you add something, you need to blend it, right? So all those things needs uh, analysis to be uh, to be uh, done in order to have the properties of that material. And as you know, that polymer can uh, can be blend. Okay, so there are three types of polymer blend, which is immiscible polymer blends, compatible polymer blends, and miscible polymer blends. So what is polymer blends actually? It's a polymer mixture. It's a class materials analog to metal and alloy. Okay, we assume it as, as a metal and alloy in which at least two polymers are blended together to create a new material with different physical properties. If polymer blend with a polymer, we call it polymer blend. If polymer, you mix it with... Uh, natural fiber or any fillers such as carbon, uh, fiberglass and so on, we call it composite. So that is the difference. Okay. So these three types of uh, 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 polymer blends uh, represent different properties. Okay. Okay. For, for Immiscible polymer blend, when you blend it, it is not homogeneous and you can have two types of glass transition temperature when you send it uh, for analysis. So that is how you need to know whether your, uh, whether your blending is homogeneous or not. You can send it to thermal analysis. If you uh, find out that there are two types of glass transition temperature, Observe, so this blending is not homogeneous because it gives you two types of glass transition temperature, meaning that two material still in that polymer, okay, in that uh, sample. Okay, so this is the example of the um, immiscible uh, polymer blend. And this is for compatible. Okay, a bit, uh, this is uh, homogeneous, but uh, the one part of the polymer is major, give major properties for that material. So we call it compatible polymer blends. Okay, for C, miscible polymer blends, meaning that when you send it for analysis, it's only given you one type of uh, glass transition temperature. So for this miscible blend, your blending is very homogeneous and your sample uh, produce a new material that is a combination between A and B. Okay, so that is miscible polymer blend. So that is the, okay, so when you send it for the analysis, uh, so this is the graph that you can get. Okay, the analysis that we use here is differential scanning calorie metric. Okay, so that is the things that uh, on polymeric material that leads to the thermal analysis, uh, uh, thermal analysis of the sample. Okay, now we start with a thermal analysis of polymeric based material. Okay, uh, until now, is there any question that can I uh, that you want to ask? Uh, we can proceed. No, that. No, that. Because so I can proceed, right? <coughs> okay. So, so, um, so this is the thermal analysis. What is thermal analysis? Is the measurement of the changes in a materials properties as a function of temperature, okay? So there's a lot of thermal analysis, the thermogravimetric analysis, the differential scanning calorimetry. We'll also have a dynamic mechanical analysis, thermal mechanical analysis. But today, I only focus on differential scanning calorimetry 
and thermogravimetry. Okay, so what is differential scanning calorimetry? So this, before we go on that, so why we need to test on differential scanning calorimetry? Okay, so industry want the information on melting temperature, decomposition, mass change, crystallization, glass transition temperature, thermal conductivity, and this all this information only can get by doing thermal analysis. And, and these are the example in the industry of pharmaceutical polymers food in order to get the information on TG. And a TG is a glass transition temperature and specific heat is a CP, TM is a melting point. And why they want to get this kind of information is they want to know the storage temperature, they want to know the processing condition for that sample, uh, for that uh, uh, medicine, okay, in order to avoid any uh, uh, damage done to the uh, sample. Okay, that's why the thermal analysis is very important for polymeric base material. Okay, so now we go to the why we need to, what is the SC action? Okay, so technique in which the heat flow rate of the sample is monitored. The difference in heat flow rate of the sample compared to the reference material is monitored. So this is the SC. You have, um, this is the, what we call the, the instrument. I think ITS have it, right? So there, there is a small instrument only. It's not a, so small. It's a tabletop instrument, which is you can put it on the lab. And inside that, we have the DSC cell. So there are small pan here. Okay, one you will put your sample with uh, in the pan, and one you need a pan without a sample. Okay, so that is the thing on the DSC. We need to find the energy absorbed by your sample in order to melt, in order to crystallize, or in order to change phase. So that is the, the simple way to understand the SC. Okay. When the heat flow to the both pan, so the energy absorbed for this pan and also this pan is the same, right? So, but the energy absorbed for, for the sample pan, sample pan is more compared to the reference pan. So the difference of the energy absorbed for, by this pan compared to this pan is the energy absorbed by the sample in order to melt or to crystallize and also to change phase. So that is the principle of TGA, of TSC, okay? So they need two, two pan, which is one is reference pan and one is the sample pan, okay? And uh, when you, the, the simple thing I put here is when you want to, uh, to cook uh, an egg, okay? So you put in a pan, right? And then you put the same pan without an egg. So the, the energy absorbed by the pan here is the energy, the same energy absorbed by the pan here without an egg. But this one will be absorbed more energy because it has egg on the pan. So the energy of the uh, absorbed by the egg uh, is measured by the difference of these two uh, energy absorbed. Okay, the total of this, you deduct with the total energy that absorbed by this pen, so you can get the energy absorbed by the egg. So that is a simple uh, understanding on the SC. Lah. So I hope you understand the principle of the SC. So, so that's why the name is differential scanning calorie metric, okay? And provide qualitative and quantitative information about endothermic, which is heat flows into the sample, and exothermic, heat flows out of the sample, and uh, or changes in the heat 
capacity. So th that is the things that uh, DSC can measure. And what is heat capacity? Heat capacity is the ability of your sample to store heat. Okay. So that is the things in the uh, DSC analysis. Okay, so how the process happened? The sample is placed in a small sample pan and then inserted into the cell of the machine. And the cell is where the test conducted and the data is collected. So this is the DSC cell. And inside here, this is what happened. Okay, there are uh, gas, halogen gas we use, and also the sample pan is the inert material. So why we need inert and halogen gas? Because we don't want any reaction happen between your sample and the environment. So if the, uh, the, the reaction, site reaction happen, there will be um, what we call uh, inaccurate result that you will get after the analysis. Okay, and the, the, uh, the specialty of uh, DSC is it is a fast analysis and typically about 30 minutes for each sample and easy sample preparation and can be applied to solid and liquid sample and you can have it a wide temperature range which is certain uh, instrument can go until 600 degrees Celsius but certain uh, 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 instrument can go until 1000 degrees Celsius. So uh, the wide range temperature, so you can send your sample uh, for this kind of analysis and you can get the information of your melting point, of the melting point, glass transition temperature, and also crystallization. If you produce a thermoset polymer, you can get the information on curing process. Okay, class, is it okay until now? Yes, miss. Okay, yeah. can I continue? Okay, this is the basic um, basic uh, curve for the SC analysis. Okay, this is uh, where here is the heat flow uh, versus temperature. And after you run the, the analysis, so the, the instrument will come up with the result like this. This is an auto automatic and very fast uh, analysis. You uh, straight away will get the data after the analysis. Okay. So we focusing here, sample is a polymer, type polymer material and uh, it will it will be can be elastomer, thermoplastic, or thermoset. Okay, so what is inside the, of the instrument is thermobalance in order to check the difference of mass happen before and after the analysis. Okay, why they call it thermobalance? Because it's a very small, uh, tiny balance that put inside of the DSC cell. And we have, uh, we need to have a sample holder here, the sample holder. So the sample holder must be in a material such as platinum, aluminum, and gold. Also gold. Gold also can be a uh, sample holder. And also ceramic. Okay. And the volume of pen also is a smaller, which is 40 ml to five, uh, 500 microliter for each of the sample pen. And then, of course, we need to have furnace, okay, that can be heat from ambient to 1000 degrees Celsius. And certain instrument can exceed to 1600 degrees Celsius. And <clears throat> the heating rate of each instrument can be from 0 0.1 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius per minute. What his heating rate is, uh, in Malaysia we call it, in, in Malay we call it uh, kadar pemanasan, which is uh, how much uh, this uh, instrument can heat your sample in a minute. Okay, how much temperature increase in a minute for that sample. 
Okay. And then there will be uh, insulation and cooling of the exterior of the furnace is required to avoid heat transfer. And we need to have a gas. Okay. So the gas here is uh, nitrogen or argon in order to prevent oxidation of the sample. And um, there will be a uh, temperature exist calibrated using material known Curie point that uh, can exchange from ferromagnetic to become paramagnetic material. And this material need to have a cooling system. Okay, if the cooling system is too long, so uh, this instrument is uh, is not good lah. So we need to have the cooling system that is very fast because we need to set to send uh, another sample for analysis. Okay, so this is the criteria if you want to buy uh, the SC analysis. If your faculty want to buy it, uh, the SC analysis, please uh, look at the cooling system and also the heating rate. Okay. So the process is uh, when you wake the sample, okay, and then after that you put in the in the in the instrument, and they will wake again, and a small portion of sample transferred to the pen, and wait again, okay. When the sample and reference pen are in the position, push gas is applied, okay. And why we need the uh, the helium and nitrogen is to get rid moisture from the sample. And the SE instrument is computer control experiment and perform automatically after users put the parameter, such as temperature program and various calibration parameters. So after you put the parameter, such as how uh, maximum temperature that you want to use for your sample, uh, heating rate and uh, what kind of information you want, melting point, plus transition temperature, or curing, and so on. So you push your start button, the analysis will start. So that is the thing happened to the DSC analysis. So the process happened involves the endothermal and exothermal. Endothermal is heat flow into the sample. Exothermal is heat flows out from the sample. So if you if the melting uh, process it involves the endothermal crystallization it involves the exothermal process. So this is the process involved during the DSC analysis and what kind of uh, peak direction that you can get from that. Okay. So this is the basic like I said before this is the basic curve for the DSC analysis. Okay, there will be two types of heating, which is first heating and second heating. Okay, the first heating, you will get the information of the uh, thermal history of your material. And the second heating is the, uh, you can get the information of the material for uh, material, material behavior, which is whether it is uh, uh, or whether it's have the glass transition temperature. Okay, so that is the things that you can get from DSC analysis. So the thing that you can have, the information that you can have in, uh, in analysis, the data of DSC is materials identification. So when you produce a sample, and you don't know whether your sample is amorphous or semi-crystalline. So you send it for uh, DSC analysis. So from that, you can get these two types of pink. If your sample is a an amorphous material, you will don't have the crystalline crystallization pink. So if your sample is amorphous, you cannot get this crystallized uh, crystallization peak. So if you get this kind of peak, so your sample is either semi-crystalline or crystalline material. So that is the first thing on how to differentiate be between amorphous and semi-crystalline. And after that, you can send your sample for further investigation in order to confirm um, whether your sample is very amorphous, is amorphous or semi-crystalline, okay? And then we can uh, send it for melting point analysis. If you produce a sample, 
with a combination of two types of material like this glucose fructose and saccharose we can see that the saccharose have higher melting point compared to glucose and fructose okay these two glucose and fructose is a combination a saccharose is a combination of these two structure glucose and fructose so as you can see when you combine it so the blend the blending of it uh, giving you the higher uh, uh, what we call melting point of uh, uh, saccharose so the complicated structure also giving you the higher melting temperature of this material and the area of the pit is the energy absorbed by your sample in order to melt so this area also giving you uh, the information the information on how uh, much this uh, uh, fructose needs energy in order to melt okay so these are the things that you can use in order to analyze your sample it's on the structure of the material it's the energy under the happening area of the peak okay and the uh, why the uh, this kind of material is uh, give you higher melting temperature compared to the glucose and fructose so you can look at the structure of each in order to analyze the sample and we also can get the information of glass transition or melting point like i said before on the polymer blend so so if you have one glass transition is miscible blend which is very homogeneous okay so if you have these two peak here you got another peak of glass transition meaning that your sample is miscible, immiscible polymer blend uh, so that is how um, the sc can help you when you have the sample you run it for the SC, you can get the information uh, of the change phase of your material. So glass transition temperature represents the temperature where your samples start to change phase. So this is the temperature where polyethylene terephthalate start to change phase from solid to liquid. And here is the, uh, is the what? area where your sample is in a rubbery uh, rubbery form okay so this is what we call glass transition temperature and after that uh, the sample during the the heating they will give off heat the instrument will off heat so there will be a process to cooling and this is why this is when the crystallization peak will come up okay if the sample is amorphous there will be no area there will be no peak on crystallization and after that there will be a heating uh, process again okay and then there will be a curve for melting temperature of the material okay so this is also for glass transition temperature why glass transition temperature is very important so this is the indicator in order for industry to have the information in order to do the processing of polymer if you want to process the polymer so you have to know the minimum temperature and maximum temperature for your sample if not your sample will be burned in the injection molding in the uh, what we call uh, in the mixer and so on. So that is the, the importance of uh, DSC analysis to give you the information of glass transition temperature and also melting temperature. Okay. So this is for compatibility. Okay. Materials condition. Also, can, information can you get from DSC analysis? So like this big there are three types of sample, which is A, B, and C. For B, for A, 
only one glass transition temperature observed for this sample. For B and C, for B, you have two types of glass transition temperature for the sample, meaning that this is immiscible polymer blends. And for C, also uh, two types of uh, uh, glass transition temperature represent the incompatible uh, polymer blend of this sample. Okay, class, you understand until now? Yes, miss. Okay, the 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 more the one the one more information that you can get is materials properties whether it is curing process or crystalline crystallinity uh, process. So for curing process, when you run your sample and you got the baseline, meaning that your sample is fully cured. If you run, you send your epoxy or thermoset polymer sample, and then you got this kind of pick for DSC analysis, meaning that your sample is still under cross-linking process. So for thermoset polymer, if your sample is un still under cross-linking process, it is not advisable for you to go and produce a product from that curing thermoset polymer. So, <clears throat> You need to make sure your sample is fully cured and then go and then it is uh, good for you to produce a product uh, from that kind of sample. Okay, so this is how to differentiate between thermoplastic and thermoset. If you have this kind of curve, which is represent glass transition, crystallization and melting or glass transition and melting temperature. So this is for thermoplastic polymer, okay? So that is one indicator in order to, uh, to differentiate whether your sample is thermoplastic or thermoset. And if you have a thermoset sample and you send for DSC analysis and your sample is fully cured, you will get this kind of graph, which is baseline graph. Okay, so that is how you differentiate two types of polymer by using differential scanning calorimetry, which is the baseline for cross-link uh, thermoset and this kind of curve for thermoplastic, okay? So that is the beauty of differential scanning calorimetry. A lot of information you can get from it. Okay, but there are limitations on, on uh, DSC analysis because the interpretation of results is highly dependent based on the analyst experience. If you always send your sample for TGA DSC analysis, so it is okay, you have a lot of experience on how to analyze the data. So the interpretation is based on your uh, experience and the technique analyze the bulk properties of the sample, not represent the whole sample, which is because your sample that you use is only a small, sam small uh, sample, which is 10 milligram, uh, and you produce your sample in a square, square form, right? So if you want to make sure that your, sam your result is accurate, you need to send the 10 parts of your sample. So you can, uh, from the square part, you 10 point, you, uh, you take it uh, a bit from uh, the left side, the bit from the right side and the bottom side, and then you send it for the essay analysis. And if it's giving you the constant, uh, the consistent result, meaning that uh, the sample is uh, good and the, the mixing is very good, which is uh, giving you the uh, consistent result for each part of your sample. And the machine is highly sensitive. So if there's any uh, contamination in your sample, so the, uh, this uh, instrument can always detect it. So that is the limitation of the SC. 
And the test method is unable to differentiate between samples that have similar melting point. Certain material will have uh, <coughs> uh, what we call uh, same melting point and same glass transition. So you need to uh, do further analysis in order to confirm that your sample, uh, uh, you have the information on melting point, but you don't know whether this what this kind of material is uh, PP or PE because it come it giving you the same information. So you need to have further inform further analysis in order to know what is your sample. Okay. So uh, that's all for the SC analysis. Any question you want to ask before we go to the difference between term uh, TG, thermography and metric analysis, and differential scanning calorimetry? <coughs> Any question, class? Maybe not yet so far. I think Kira, Kira is huh? raised his hand. Oh, Kira, yeah, please. Okay, thank you for the time. Okay, uh, okay. let me introduce myself. My name is Kira Yudatama. I am a student on S1 on material engineering. So I want okay. to... Hi, Kira. Hi, so... I want to ask how I can differentiate about between glass transition and melting because it is both like a valley, but I think sometimes we can being switched. Oh, how, how to differentiate that? Okay, so uh, commonly glass transition is the, the, the peak that comes earlier compared to the melting point. So the first peak that you found in the curve is the glass transition temperature. But um, for your information, uh, certain sample, it is based on your sample, uh, you cannot find the glass, it cannot give you the glass transition temperature. If your peak here is here, uh, it is represent your melting point, not glass transition temperature. So if you have only two peaks in your sample, only maybe crystallization and melting. So you can send your sample to DMA, Dynamic Mechanical Analysis, that can give you the accurate uh, temperature for glass transition temperature. So uh, sometimes the SC can give you the glass transition temperature, uh, but certain sample, okay, may, uh, I have experienced it where I can get the information of glass transition temperature from DSC, but I can get it from dynamic mechanical analysis. Okay, because dynamic mechanical analysis provide you the information of tangent delta. So the tangent delta in the dynamic mechanical analysis represent the glass transition temperature of your sample. So if you have this kind of peak earlier in the curve, meaning that earlier temperature of your process, it represents glass transition temperature. If you don't have this kind of curve and you only have this kind of curve, this one represents your melting temperature, not glass transition temperature. Okay, uh, is that uh, help you, Fira? Uh, yes, very much. Thank okay. you. Okay, any more question? Uh, can we proceed to TGA? Okay. Uh, excuse me, Dr. Nur Nazmi. Before, yeah. before we continue, maybe you um, still have about 20 minutes to, <laughs> yeah, before we continue with another uh, discussion. Okay. Okay, any more questions? Uh, 20 minutes before, yeah. before we end our session, right? Yeah, yeah, before. Uh, end of pres your presentation. Okay, so can we proceed a bit on TGA? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I will go fast on this. I just want to uh, to make sure uh, you to how know how to differentiate between DSC and TGA. So because DSC and TGA is like a sibling, Sadik Pradik, which is uh, uh, what we call it, they membantu satu sama lain. So that's why if you want uh, some certain people will do these two analysis together in order to get 
the accurate result on the thermal analysis. So what is thermogravit metric analysis? What is the difference between TGA and uh, DSC is this one is uh, uh, focusing on the change in mass. When you put your sample under heat environment, uh, what happened to your sample? So it focusing on uh, mass reduction of your sample when you put it under heat environment. So the key point here is focusing on weight, temperature, and temperature change. So this uh, sample uh, will focusing on degradation temperature of your sample. So this analysis is uh, very, uh, what we call straightforward. It gives you the information on decomposition temperature of your sample. Okay, it cannot give you the melting point, but the decomposition temperature. So if you want to have the melting point temperature, you need to send your sample for the assay analysis. And the uh, different, the main difference is this uh, TGA only needs one sample pan. You don't have reference pan for TGA analysis. Okay, no reference pan needed for this. But you need the thermal balance uh, function in order to uh, provide the information of the uh, change in mass of your sample. Okay, so this is the degradation process, uh, the curve that you can get from TGA analysis. And the curve will be weight percent versus temperature. And this is the what we call, we can do compositional analysis for this sample. Okay, so the instrumentation just the same with uh, DSC analysis because it is using the same instrument, but the difference is the, you can switch whether you want to do it in a DSC mode or TGA mode. So the, the main difference is uh, TGA only needs one uh, sample pan. Okay, and the information, uh, the type of sample, uh, the type of sample pan, the gas needed is the same such as the SC analysis. Okay, so we go what we can have from TGA. So this is type of TGA curve. Okay, if you have your the graph like this, so they will mean that your sample not decompose. So no decomposition happened to your sample. If your sample have this one, this is a rapid initial mass loss for your sample. And if you have this one, we call it single stage decomposition, meaning that your sample only have one material inside of your sample. If you have this kind of graph, we call it multi-stage decomposition. So multi-stage decomposition, we present you the uh, what we call multi uh, material involved in your sample. Okay. <clears throat> and this one is a multi stage decomposition, but your instrument cannot detect acu accurately a temperature decomposition temperature of your sample. And if you use different type of gas like oxygen, there will be an oxidation process. So there will be gain in mass of your graph. Okay, so you also can check on oxidation process of your sample. If you want to know the uh, whether your sample is coral or not, you can change the gas into oxygen and you can, you can get this kind of graph. Product of oxidation reaction decompose again at higher temperature. Okay, so this is the common uh, decomposition curve for your sample. Okay, there will be heating process such as a light DSC analysis. Okay, and at the end, they will measure the change in mass of your sample and the graph represent the decomposition information of your sample. Okay, so from the DSC, we can have a composition analysis by the uh, this uh, curve that we get from the result. Okay, the first one may be volatile and then polymer and then the residue may be the fillers that uh, the temperature is, the decomposition temperature is higher than the temperature that you put here. Okay, so this is the uh, commonly uh, what degrade during the 
the temperature. Okay, so this is what we call the decompositional analysis, where the polymer will degrade first, okay, and then the filler, and then the ceramic. So that is why that is how you uh, analyze the data of the more gravimetric analysis. Okay, and we can also compare compare uh, between the material between the sample that you have produced with different types of uh, maybe fillers, different types of percentage of fillers. So you will get the different type percentage of residue. So you can analyze by adding this kind of, of fillers. So the decomposition uh, temperature is higher compared to the, the things that you didn't put any fillers. Uh, that is how you analyze the data. Okay, uh, so this is the graph for epoxy glass composite. Uh, so the uh, the percentage of your sample is hundred percent here. They will give you the information of how much percentage left here, and then how much the percentage left at the end of the process. So from that you know how much of your polymer or your fillers left during the analysis. Okay, so this one is the same sample with a different types of fillers. Okay, PSU represent the polymer and you add fillers inside. So uh, different uh, addition of uh, fillers will giving you different types of uh, degradation curve like PSU 2000. Okay, the degrade, de degrade earlier compared to PSU DE 2000 and PSU 2000 cross C. So that is the things that you can uh, highlight in the uh, analysis of DGA uh, the thermal analysis. Okay, so we can have the information of unknown sample. You produce a new sample and you don't know what inside and you can have the information of decomposition. Okay, and you can send the residue of your sample to the FTIR or mass spectrometer in order to know more what inside of your sample. Okay, so that is the things that you can get in TGA analysis. They're very, very straightforward. Uh, they will give you the instrument will give you the uh, details of the decomposition percentage and also the composition weight, uh, what is left and what is uh, decomposed. So like this is the A, is a no degradation happen for A sample, but uh, any higher decomposition percentage for B, C and D. So that is the things that you can get from TGA analysis. So this graph will be just like this, no extra curve, only decomposition, decomposition curve for TGA. And you can, if you produce a sample with a different types of polymer, different types of fillers, so you will get the different types of decomposition. Uh, uh, curve for this based on, and you can analyze it by referring to the melting temperature of each material that you use inside of the sample. Okay, because uh, the properties of each sample uh, will uh, affect the result that you get from TG, for TGA analysis. Okay, same goes to the, this one is a composite with a different types of uh, percentage of carbon, so as you can see, without, without filler, it's a degree earlier compared to the uh, composite with the filler. Okay. And the higher the percentage of uh, filler, okay, higher percentage of, of filler will give you a higher percentage of residue. Uh, that is the basic, uh, that is the how you analyze the data. Okay. Now we and come to the end of the slide for TGA. So TGA curve is not a fingerprint curve. So which uh, different parameter will give you different result. Like if you use the different environment of gas, uh, different heating rates, 
different maximum temperature, they will give you a different uh, result. So before you, you so that's why before you send your sample to TGA or uh, DSC analysis, <coughs> you need to read the journal and get the range of temperature that used for that sample. And then what kind of environment um, gas that they use in order to make sure that the result that you get is accurate and related to your sample. And then this uh, TG also limited, limited to quantification of major parts. And sometimes you will get the overlapping decomposition result. Okay. And that's why you need to do the further identification by using FDIR or mass spectroscopy testing. <coughs> okay. So that's all. Uh, before I end, I want to uh, show you my research project. Okay. So I have four research project. Uh, before, on, before this, I on rubber toughen Kenaf composite. Okay. Where I toughen the uh, polyester and add Kenaf inside in order to produce a composite. And, and then I also involved in biosynthesis nanosilver, where I use extract plant in order to reduce the size of nanosilver. And at the same time, uh, it can be used as a cleaning process for uh, water. Okay. And then I also involved in polyurethane in a grouting as a grouting material. Okay. And um, I have one master research student here, graduated master research uh, student for this project. And currently I'm on graphene and graphene oxide actually, okay, producing uh, face mask, which is coated graphene oxide, okay, that is uh, related to what we have uh, faced now. And we try to produce this kind of uh, uh, face mask lah, in order to help people to improve the permeability of the face mask. So this is our future outlook lah, okay, on polypropylene fabric fill, graphene oxide from recycled carbon as virus filter chip. Okay, so uh, that's all from me and I am welcome any collaboration from ITS and we can work together and in order to increase uh, uh, knowledge in the polymeric material research area. Okay, thank you. Wow, well, thank you very much, Dr. Natsumi. Maybe we can give a warm applause virtually for her. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so nice. much. Yeah. Nice presentation. Uh, maybe in the future we may make some collaboration related to this, this project. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because um, I think we, we have in a similar field, right? Yeah. Similar area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, we still have a couple minutes around 10 to 15 minutes to discuss. Yeah. Maybe okay. from the floor, students, or maybe from I see here, a lecture also attend this uh, presentations. Okay. Can we get this presentation material? Oh, of course, I will. I will send it to Dr. Amelia. Can? Yeah. After this. <laughs> okay. Maybe student, uh, do you have any questions? I give you some uh, question for Dr. Najmi. Okay, if if still hello. Hello. Oh hello? no no no. Okay, maybe um, may I give the questions. Okay. Okay. Uh, during thermal analysis by using the SG, uh -huh. we need to set the the rate of heating and also yes. cooling, right? So, yes, is there yes. any effect 
uh, yeah, any effect to the to the result of the peak resulted from GSC when we change the rate of both uh, heating or cooling. Okay, so the, the important of heating rate is uh, if uh, heating rate, we call it kadar pemanasan. If it's yeah. too fast, it cannot detect the accurate temperature mm -hmm. of your sample to change phase and your sample start to melt. Maybe the curve, uh, they will have the curve, but the peak maybe not so big because it's uh, the temperature that you put for one minute, uh, for one Celsius increase is higher compared to the the one, the thing that's supposed to be put. Lah. So that's why you need to refer to the journal first uh, about your basic material. And then you put the range of temperature used is related to the previous study of your sample. Mm -hmm. What what about what about if the rate is too slow? Yeah. It's too slow. It's, yeah. Uh, if if the heating rate because the heating rate that is the thing that is the problem. Uh, if the heating rate is too slow, there will be a longer time in order to yeah. to finish the analysis because you put the the end temperature uh, as example six hundred degrees Celsius. So your mm -hmm. heating rate is one degree Celsius per minute. So it's going to be very long. Yeah. But the, you you still get the result, but it's uh, going to be a long uh, process because uh, one uh, degree Celsius per minute is too long in order to get to the 20 degrees Celsius if your glass transition temperature is 20 degrees Celsius, right? So so that's why we need to refer in order to to uh, limit the time and to have a fast analysis and very accurate analysis. <laughs> but basically, um, no significant effect. Maybe uh, significant effect to your sample. I think uh, if you use the higher, the higher, higher heating rate, maybe it's going to be uh, that is the thing that I said before on the on the peak that uh, produce. Uh, maybe certain temperature they cannot they cannot detect such as class transition and so on. But for, uh, for uh, I think the slow, the, the, there will be effect maybe, I think on the heat flow to the sample, uh, maybe it takes longer time and maybe the accuracy. Maybe some shift, yeah, maybe some shift of speed a little bit. Yeah, right, uh, right shift, yeah, right. yes, yes. There will be a different readings uh, yeah, because yeah, there yeah. will be a shift on the peak. Yes, that's the word. So shift of the pig. <laughs> okay. Uh, any question from the student from the floor? Oh, yeah, I see here. Ke Kevin, maybe Kevin. Okay, what once more, once more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, from TGA curve, yeah, we normally after several degrees Celsius, maybe around mm -hmm. five hundred, yeah, the the mass uh, almost saturated. Yeah, this is the last yes. composition, yes. the complete degrees composition. Yes. Is it possible for the one sample of the polymer may be until zero of the mass. Is it possible? Uh, there will be a yeah. Uh, meaning the, that there is no residue for that sample. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mean that? Uh, because current, uh, maybe, maybe we will. Uh, you can have that kind of situation, but uh, I will. Uh, I still have a name. I tak pernah experience on that, but uh, from my readings, there's a there's a result that will with no residue, which is after 500 or after the temperature that you put, uh, so the all decompose, 100 percent decompose, no residue. There will be a maybe no ash, right? So it's based on the material that you use, lah. <laughs> But always, I think sometimes maybe the bits residue inside of your sample because okay. of, uh, I'm not sure on the percentage of the hundred percent. But 
uh, from my readings, there's a situation re uh, related to that. Okay, but um, uh, from my experience, I can uh, still have about 20 or 10 percent that is related to the residue of the sample. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Maybe uh, from the floor, because we still have some couple minutes before end the meeting, uh, the lecture, sorry. Uh, let's see. No question. <laughs> Pascal, Pascal, Dave. Pascal, Just Pascal, yeah. Can you hear my voice? <laughs> yeah, the most comfortable from the uh, the, the afternoon is <laughs> rest. <Yes. laughs> afternoon time. I understand. Don't worry. <laughs> I think all of your students understand what I have uh, presented before. That's why no question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's give uh, the chance to uh, Miss Mrs. Malia, uh, maybe. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Nur Najmi, for the lecture. <laughs> jumpa kita di sini. <laughs> so, ada apa apa soalan mau tanya? <laughs> no, it's oh, it's clear. I think. Uh, hopefully, it helps a lot of uh, it giving you a lot of information. It's not a lot lah, because uh, a bit uh, but information on thermal analysis from me. Hope benefit to all of the ITS members today. Yes, inshallah. Mm. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. And hopefully, I we can have this kind of session again next year, next semester, and so on. Yeah, inshallah. It's a, it's a good, good, uh, what we call collaboration by yeah. doing this kind of uh, program, right? Yeah, we hope in the near future. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oke, okay. uh, saya kira sudah cukup yeah, yeah. ya. Tidak ada pertanyaan dari mahasiswa semuanya. Mahasiswa semuanya harap paham ya. <laughs> <laughs> ya, ya kebetulan ini um, materi tema untuk lecture pekan ini adalah characterization for polymer ah. materials ya. Yeah. Terus Jadi memang, memang ikut tema lah. Tepat sekali. <laughs> <laughs> okay, ya, okay. sudah cukup ya Bu Amalia? Ya, ya, ya Pak. Ya. Baik. Um, Bapak Ibu lecturer juga khususnya spesialis Dr. Nur Najmi, terima kasih. Thank you very much. Terima kasih banyak-banyak. Semoga semoga memberikan keberkahan dan manfaat bagi kita semua. Okay. Ya. Saya uh, nak mengambil kesempatan ini. Terima kasih buat semua yang menjemput saya. Uh, uh, so harap kita boleh berjumpa lagi. Insya Allah. Uh, ya sudah okay. cukupkan. Alhamdulillah. Okay, ya. Alhamdulillah. Kita tutup ya sesi kita diskusi untuk case lecture sesi ini. Sekali lagi terima kasih Dr. Nasmi dan teman-teman semua serta mahasiswa. Saya akhiri. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you Dr. Okay, thank you so much. Bye. Ya. Terima kasih. Terima kasih. Yeah. Silakan Bu Amalia untuk di yeah. You may leave this Room Dr. Natsmi. Ya, Pak. Kayaknya masih ada kelas, G. Jadi, ya. kita saja yang lift. Oke, saya lift sendiri ya. Oke, makasih, Pak, G. Sama-sama. Stay health, stay safe. Merdeka. Merdeka. <laughs> makasih ya yang sudah hadir.
Terima kasih dokter. Ya bu, sama-sama. Mail. Yes yes. Sis, Udah. di live on YouTube-nya stop. Oh oke. Okay.